Okay, I think we're ready to begin. My name is Caitlin, and I'm with Saskatchewan Prairie Conservation Action Plan and Prairie Wind Silver Sage. And this is sort of a, a joint event hosted by the, the two groups. Um, both are nonprofit organizations, and this is kind of part of um, Saskatchewan Prairie Conservation Action Plan's monthly speaker series, and then also part of Prairie Wind's Eco Museum. Um, so, first of all, thank you all for coming. Um, I'm really honored to be able to introduce Jeff Hallride. Um, I've been around the park since 2007, and I've had the, the privilege to be able to go over to the park with him and hear different presentations and I'm always amazed to, to hear somebody who's so passionate about um, burrowing owl conservation in Canada um, and I'm really excited to hear what he has to say. So there you go Jeff. Great. Thanks Caitlin. Well I'll, I'll reciprocate the compliment and say I've, I'm always enjoying going to Harvest Moon and eating Caitlin's uh, <laughs> <laughs> delicious meals. So I look forward to doing that in the next couple of nights. Uh, thank you all for coming out tonight. Um, I'm glad it's not a warm, sunny evening out there, so you don't feel like you're losing one of the few summer evenings that we get in this part of the or in the Western Canada period. Um, I'd like to acknowledge my co-author, Helen Charfrey, who's hiding in the back corner, um, <laughs> next to Wes, most people know Wes. So a lot of the what I'm going to tell you is a result of uh, both Helen and I studying Burring Owls for over 20 years. Uh, both in Canada, uh, the United States, mostly Texas, and uh, Mexico, as you'll see. And, of course, when one retires, it's time to sum up what one found and try and pass it on. So I'm glad to be able to have another talk. Helen reminded me that there were, I gave a talk here three years ago, but I don't know how many people were here three years ago and heard my talk. Oh. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Well, it's going to be similar, so I hope you're not disappointed. Um, otherwise, for the rest of you, uh, come back in another three years and Caitlin will probably have me do it again. <laughs> so the, the uh, question I posed, as you can see with the title, is uh, where did all the burning owls go and why? So you may not even know that they're disappearing, so we'll start out with, uh, with that and then hopefully this remote works okay. So burning owls are officially endangered in Canada. They were in became endangered in 1995. And so, in fact, they were declining well before we were able to study them. And I don't want to work for government, so I can point out that one of the flaws in the Canadian system is the federal government can't study most things until they become threatened or endangered. And it's a lot easier to study something when it's abundant than it is to um, go and try and find the last few remaining ones and figure out why they disappeared. In the 1990s, they declined over 95% over that decade. So huge declines, 21% uh, 20, per year for a decade. So obviously there aren't many left and they haven't recovered since then. So here's some of the numbers just to demonstrate why there's cause for concern. And remember I said they, they were declared endangered in 95. Uh, Nature Saskatchewan has a program come up called Operation Bring Owl where landowners report uh, owls that they've got on their land. And although the number of members has grown and then stabilized, the number of owls peaked on the second year with the growth in membership at 1,100 hares and then declined dramatically through the 90s, as I mentioned, and then have just been petering out steadily ever since, um, even though the number of members has been fairly stable. And likewise, a specific study area in the Regina Plain that was started by Paul James um, in 1987, he had 78 pairs, and his, he finished his study, and the number in that area declined to zero in some years. So Troy Wellicum did a follow-up study, a PhD study with me in the Regina Plain, and he actually had to expand his study area dramatically to find 100 pairs enough to start a study, because by now, Paul James' study area had almost, they'd almost disappeared. So Troy's study area includes uh, Paul's as well. And then again, when Ray Poole and Daniel Todd started their study, they expanded the study site even more. As you can see, Troy's numbers have dropped right off. So these are bigger and bigger study areas of the Regina Plain, and they're all showing the same trend. And those of you that are biologists know it's not much fun going out and collecting zeros. So about 2011, 2012, they simply stopped trying to find boring owls because there were so few. You couldn't study them and it's just no fun to spend all summer wandering around and saying, yep, there's zero or one or two pairs. So they pretty much dis disappear from the Regina Plain. I'm sure there's the odd pair hanging in there, but there's nobody looking systematically. So I tried to include in this talk what we've learned in Grasslands Park, 
And the graph in Grasslands Park looked pretty cool, right? We, Helen and I started doing our survey in 98. We weren't experts at studying then, so maybe we missed a few pairs. Uh, the, pair, the number of pairs actually increased to 65 pairs in 2005, and then it declined since then. But that's way later than the decline that you saw on those other two graphs. But let's just have another look at those graphs. So the, our, our peak happened in here when, in fact, the uh, Paul James's study had already uh, petered off and it was starting to drop off um, in the enlarged study areas in the Regina Plain. And likewise with the landowner ones, you remember it was rippling along at the bottom. There's a tiny little peak in 0405 and then they've petered out since then. So I don't think I can easily go backwards. So the question is if we'd started surveying in, in uh, Grasslands Park in the 70s or 80s, I bet we'd have recorded hundreds of pairs. And, uh, and 65 would have been a crash, not a peak, for the few years that we've actually studied there. So this is our 19th year. That sounds like a lot of years. But when you get data sets that are going back 30 and 40 years, that gives you a true perspective of how much they've declined even here. So let's talk a little bit about burring owls. Um, I, hopefully, how many of you have seen a burring owl? So only about half the people. Well, there are some around. There's a couple of pairs on Ecotour uh, Prairie Dock Colony. Uh, try not to bother them. One pair is very close to the road. Uh, so it's best to stay in your vehicle. I, we came across a couple of fellows. I can tease people from Ontario because that's where I'm from. And they were standing in the middle of the Dixon Wire Road waving their arms up and down and said they don't see any burring owls. And I said, well, you just scared them all off. That's about the silliest way to look for them. So um, hmm. they got back in their car and patiently waited until the owls came back out or out. Uh, the owls are about 150 grams. Um, one of my students de de described them as a pop can on stilts. <laughs> so if you can imagine a, a speckled pop can um, uh, standing a bit higher on, uh, on longer legs, that's how big they are. And they like to live in open grassland and especially prairie dock colonies. They were probably super abundant in prairie dock colonies from here to Texas when prairie dogs dominated the landscape. There are in fact only about 2% of the prairie dock colonies left that were um, in existence a couple of hundred years ago. We, we as humans have managed to wipe them out almost to the, um, uh, well, certainly endangered level. Um, of course, what they don't like are plowed fields. That's not very good for prairie dogs, and prairie dogs in farm fields aren't very good for the crop either, so they're just incompatible. But they're highly compatible with rangeland. And as you can see in Grassland Park and around where there's a few other colonies outside the park. Um, cows actually, we found them often this time of year in the prairie dock colony eating the, the newly growing grass, avoiding the old grass that is um, uh, where, where it's relatively ungrazed by prairie dogs or others. What do they eat? Well we tried our, one of our captive owls on mice and as you can see looks pretty disgusted. Um, Lisa's mom when she saw this picture said she was never eating at my place again. <laughs> She was disgusted that they were using kitchen uh, cutlery and plates. But in fact, they do eat mice. They eat the bulk of the diet of burring owls are, are small rodents, mice and voles. But the bulk of the items they eat are insects. So insects are obviously much smaller than mice and voles. Uh, so uh, biomass-wise, they're small mammal eaters. Numerically, they're insect eaters. And we have great debates about what is the true character of a burring owl. Is it a, a small mammal predator that takes mice for dessert, or is it actually an insectivore that, that doesn't have enough insects and is forced to um, up, the, up the, uh, the gamble and take mice that can bite back? And that's, I'm afraid, the side I'm on. I think they're actually insectivores, but we've trashed insect populations to the point where they're forced to uh, eat rodents. And I can explain why some other time, but that gets into too much detail. One of the unique characters of burring owls is they live in burrows. Um, and they live in burrows in prairie dog colonies or associated with ground squirrels. But in fact, they don't live in ground squirrel burrows. You've seen in the popular literature, I'm sure there's books here, that says burring owls living in uh, ground squirrel burrows. If you're familiar with ground squirrels that haven't been dug up by a badger, coyote, or whatever, uh, they actually have very small burrows. It's only after a burrow has been dug out by a badger or or a coyote that um, 
and then ground squirrels move back in, that we can then call it a ground squirrel burrow, but it's actually being enlarged. So they kind of have a love-hate relationship with badgers and other digging animals. Uh, they are able to force their way into prairie dog colonies and take over burrows, whether they're abandoned or they convince the prairie dogs to leave them for a couple months, it's hard to say. But their, their relationship with um, ground squirrels is in areas away from prairie dog colonies where they've been excavated, as they say, by badgers. And they have that love-hate relationship. They need a badger to come and enlarge the burrow, but if they do, then they risk the badger coming back. And even though this brave male uh, whacked the, the uh, badger on the head, it didn't deter the badger and the nest was empty when we came back. So what's happening underground? Having a burrow underground actually allows him to lay a lot of eggs. So on average in Canada, they lay nine eggs. And somebody who's going to count fast says there's ten in there. This was taken at the uh, Kamloops Wildlife Park where they're raised in captivity. But on average, they raise nine eggs. And this would be a big brood. So half a dozen young would be an awesome brood. Most of the time, they don't. So typically, they lay nine eggs and produce only three or four young. So that's one of the core problems with burring owls is they lay a lot of eggs, but not many of those actually uh, grow up and fledge. And we're going to look at why. So in Grasslands Park, the 18 years that Helen and I have been monitoring, um, on average they have only 2.9 young. So even fewer than the average across other sites in Canada. Um, in the Hannah area, that area, that study area was abandoned in 97 they were having 3.5 young, so slightly more than in Grasslands Park, but nowhere near the nine, nine eggs that they laid. So the question is why? And I had a graduate student, Troy Wellick, who did his PhD in the Regina Plain, I mentioned him earlier, and his um, thesis focused on food supplementation. If, we, if he supplemented the uh, young in the nest, could he improve productivity? So you can see there's, I should simplify this someday, but there's, he had two feeding regimes, the checkered one and the black one, treat them as the same for the purpose here. So in 1992, they produced slightly more, but that difference wasn't significant. But it was definitely more than half a young more uh, when they were food supplemented. In 93, it made a huge difference. So here's food supplemented, produced eight young out of those nine eggs whereas the uh, non-supplemented one produced two and a half young, like we get here in Grasslands Park. Again in 96 and again in 98. 97 was a huge rodent year. Those of you who were here in the fall of 96, we had early snow across the prairies. The snow stayed all winter. The metaboles in particular reproduced under the snow. It was actually relatively warm. Was, the ground never froze. The farmers and ranchers I talked to said they could punch in post holes uh, all winter fence posts because the ground didn't freeze, it was so well insulated. That was great for meadow voles. And the um, owls had an average of 7.3 young, whether they were food supplemented or not. They didn't need the food supplementation. So overall, food supplementation can make a huge difference, except in those occasional good years. And there hasn't been a really good year since 97. So that deep, long snow hasn't happened since then. And then one last detail, I should explain too, some of these slides I don't normally put in here, but I'm putting them in for Stefano and Stan, who are new biologists in the park, to convince them that food supplementation is a good idea. So again, this is from Troy's research. You can see in 92, the um, supplemented pairs had virtually 100% survival. Here's the decline in the food, and then the unsupplemented ones. And after about three weeks, the young all survived. Um, in 93, the mortality kept going in the unsupplemented ones. Um, 97, I mentioned there was virtually no mortality. 98, here they are, and after about three weeks, they leveled out. So we kind of picked three weeks, even though there are some years where some mortality happens. Uh, the first three weeks are critical. We lose about half the young uh, die in the first three weeks. They simply starve to death in the nest. So the other problem that um, I was first given in 95 when I started to study burring owls was they're all disappearing. People were banding the owls in Regina Plain and elsewhere and not coming back. So they must be dying wherever they're going for the winter and no one knew. So we know they went south, 
question is how far. So we asked our captive owl, gave him a globe, and that wasn't very helpful. So we put the owl in charge of, in charge of driving the vehicle, and that didn't work out very well. We had close misses with the ditch, so we decided going to Mexico with an owl in charge wasn't a good idea either. So then we looked at bird banding records, and all the bird bands that had been used in Canada and Canada, uh, Alberta's, uh, sorry, Alberta had no recoveries, which is still curious, Saskatchewan and Manitoba, ended along the Gulf Coast in the fall, but there were no winter recoveries from Canadian banded owls. There was one winter recovery from a bird banded in Oklahoma, and it was found down near Guadalajara. And one of the stories I like to tell students is never ignore your first data point. It's more likely to be close to the mean than an outlier. So I went down not quite that far to um, the junction of uh, Chihuahua, Coila, and Durango with um, uh, no Ricardo Rodriguez Estrella. He'd done a master's student in this Mapimi uh, Biosphere Reserve on boring owls, and landowners told him they were there in the winter. So I went down after a lot of haranguing in the office that. You know, the taxpayers were going to pay for Jeff to go to Mexico. <laughs> I finally got to go down there and uh, walked around with Ricardo, looked at all his, his um, summer nest sites and didn't find any wintering owls. Uh, we found a lot of cactus. There were grassland areas like this, small ones, and this is where the owls had burrows, but they weren't there. We did find, we did have a lot of encounters with uh, the cactus and got a flat tire, and the second, and the third. And this was really frustrating, and someone had a match, and I told them not to light it. <laughs> so then we're about 15 kilometers from uh, our camp where we started out, and these two guys didn't have any water. So it wasn't long before the <laughs> and you can guess the result. <laughs> The result was actually that. Three of us exhausted from sipping about half a liter of water between the three of us as we trekked 15 kilometers across the equivalent of a desert. So from then on I made sure we had a, a couple of gallons of water in the vehicle wherever we went because you never know. The following year we got a break um, in that a uh, refuge manager on the Rio Grande uh, took a photograph of an owl, turned out to be banded, he told us it was banded, but it was, he, his photograph was so good, we could read this much on the band, and you can't quite see it here, but there's two plastic red bands. And Troy had banded a male owl in the Regina Plain with two red bands, and uh, the suffix was uh, 81918. So we're pretty sure this was Troy's male owl. Helen and I went down there, and uh, we found a pile of feathers. We didn't find the bands, but uh, probably a har there were harriers in the area that had eaten that owl right on the, the border with Mexico. So then we decided we should try another technique. We were studying owls in Canada, some of the graduate students I mentioned, putting transmitters on and using VHF telemetry to follow the owls um, uh, in the summer, find out their habitat use, their home range, learn more about their ecology here. So we went down to Texas, we rented the airplane that does the whooping crane surveys out of Rockport, Texas, and flew transects across southern Texas and Mexico every 50 kilometers from Houston, Texas to Guadalajara, Mexico. I think Helen and I have the world's record for listening to the static in the back of a, a Cessna aircraft. So we take four hour shifts, sitting in the back with headphones on, listening for static, waiting for a beep. And that beat meant we had an owl. We were about 8,000 feet over the ground because we determined that was the best elevation. And once we got a beep, we'd spiral down um, until we got very close to it and close to the ground, we'd take a GPS, and then went back in January uh, a year later to, uh, or the following year rather, to, uh, to find them. So we did the survey in November, December, and then went back. Uh, we had lots of adventures. Uh, we just missed um, the eruption of Mount Popopelli near uh, Puebla. We were the last plane to take off. Of course, we don't have a rear view mirror, so it was about an hour later when we turned and it looked like a, a volcanic or a um, nuclear explosion behind us and it turned out to be the, we were the last plane to leave the airport as the volcano unexpected, unexpectedly erupted. This wasn't us, but we did have our engine overheat. <laughs> 
the pilot put it into a, um, a shallow um, dip and we just passed an unmarked uh, paved runway. It wasn't on our maps and I pointed that out to the pilot. So as he's emailing or um, uh, radioing Puebla saying we're making an emergency landing, he just went straight in, landed at the runway, pulled off onto the apron in front of this big hangar and as he killed the engine, half the Mexican army came out with <laughs> machine guns on the level looking for drug runners. So this runway had been illegally paved and they were convinced we were in their first catch. So we had to do a lot of uh, talking to convince them that, that uh, we were. But we did actually find some signals. This one was in South Texas. The owl was hiding under these tall weeds and that obviously cultivated landscape that hadn't been cultivated for a while and it flew off into our thorn shrub, cactus shrubland, when we uh, finally flushed it. When we went back there a while later, this is the same field. The reason it wasn't cultivated is it's being turned into uh, condos. Um, it was never the best habitat for a boring owl, but obviously now it's even worse, um, an instance of habitat loss. We found another one in this uh, orange orchard in Veracruz. When we actually went there on the ground, the landowner said, Do you, were you guys flying over in December? Because we told him what we were doing, and he'd, he'd been in the orchard and actually uh, watched us spiraling down and wondered what the heck we were doing. So, <laughs> unfortunately, this owl was, all, was dead. Um, it probably killed by roadside hawks. Uh, we were able to find the transmitter was still functioning. We found part of the owl. Um, but, and the note here, we... Invariably, whenever we were in Mexico, we were able to work with Mexican biologists, partly to help train them and to make them more aware of um, what we were doing and, what, and the plight of the owls, but also for our own safety so that we wouldn't get into situations that um, we need, shouldn't be in. And then we also found one in Michoacan, uh, not that far from where the butterflies go, but a much lower elevation in this uh, cactus thorn shrub, a shrub land, not in a hole in the ground at all, but simply hiding it under the, the base of the plants for the daytime. And there were probably half a dozen owls. We found quite a few owls in here before we saw the one with the, with the transmitter. <coughs> so our, our VHF telemetry recoveries um, gave us one near Houston, and then these three headed down into central Mexico. This one, if you remember, not that far from the band recovery from Oklahoma, down near uh, both central Mexico near Guadalajara. Oh, sorry, I've been trying to get rid of this. So then I have another graduate student and we tried another technique looking at stable isotopes. So we can look at the chemistry of the feathers and based on the ratios of hydrogen and deuterium and then isotopes of carbon and nitrogen, we can estimate where the owls came from. We take the feathers, <coughs> grind them up, send them through a mass spectrometer and then plot them on a base map. So the first thing we had to do was create a base map, which we did from uh, delineated populations from nestlings. So we took the feathers from nestlings, figured out a base map, like you just saw, this is the wrong order, and then um, take a, a feather that we didn't know where it was from and estimate where it was from based on our base map. So that's our, this is our base map, and we got feathers from central Mexico and some from Texas, and there were um, eight, I think it is, from uh, southern Alberta and southern Saskatchewan that were from owls wintering in this area. So, sorry, these are wintering owls, and we're backtracking where their feathers were grown uh, the previous year. So it was further proof that, in fact, central Mexico had a lot of Canadian owls wintering, but also coastal Texas. Okay, so sorry, they're there again, I forgot to leave this slide. Uh, then a new technology came along called geolocators. And geolocators record time and light levels. And based on that, you can determine sunrise and sunset and day length, and then estimate the latitude and longitude of the owl. And here's the track of one owl uh, from southern Alberta, in this case, the 1 4 area. Uh, interestingly, it spent a month in Montana, flew down through the Great Plains to the coast of uh, Texas spent a month there and then wandered inland into central Mexico and then the, the unit quit on Christmas Day uh, so they have its track until December 24th and then we had to recover the owl back in Canada to download its data. Uh, 
but it started to give us a pattern of where these owls are moving and the timing that it's not just a direct migration. In fact, this owl stopped twice on its uh, way south. And then finally, the technology, of course, gets better and better. And just as the guy's about to retire, satellite transmitter small enough to put on an owl appeared. So we managed to, uh, to do that for three years and get a really good idea of where these owls go. So these are tiny 5-gram transmitters with an even tinier solar panel to recharge the batteries. Um, and, and they talk to satellites and tell us in real time where the owls are. So the first one we did went from uh, southern Alberta. Uh, it spent a lot of time in northern Montana, just across the border. But again, because it was real time, we were actually able to drive there and see the field where it was. And the field was covered in badger holes and grasshoppers. Perfect place to molt one's feathers. And we think that's what the owl did for the couple of months she spent there. Then she went fairly rapidly down into New Mexico. Better not touch the screen or fall over. And then made a, a sort of strange right turn and flew over to Baja. And that was too intriguing for Helen and I. So we, by this point, uh, Mr. Harper was in power. There was no travel money. So we took time, took a week off and her own, paid her own airfare and hooked up with a, a veterinarian in um, uh, Negro, no. Grero Negro. I was going to say Negro Modelo, but that's a beer. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and this this white area is the largest salt evaporation plant in the world, and that's where they all had gone. So away from a, a wetland that was full of peregrine falcons and other raptors into a fairly desolate setting, but there were shrikes here, there were insects, there were small uh, lizards, um, and these burrows had been dug as best as we could tell by feral dogs. So the owl had found a very secretive place to spend the winter. Uh, and you'll see um, shortly, she also made a, a dramatic return. So our other satellite transmitters uh, provide a pretty uh, convincing picture that a lot of our owls go into central Mexico. And this area that's called the Bajillo of central Mexico, it's actually the river valley of the Lerma River that starts near Puebla, goes through Mexico City, or near Mexico City, and past Guadalajara and out to the Pacific Ocean. And that is, in fact, why the Mayan Indians were there. This is the corn belt of Mexico. So as much as you're living in the wheat belt of Canada, this is the corn belt, and that's where the owls are going for the winter. It's a lower elevation uh, valley that runs east-west with the main mountain ranges to the north and the volcanic regions uh, to the south. And this is what it looks like. So shrubby areas. Uh, some grasslands, a mixture of habitats. So the owls aren't going to big open grasslands like we find them in the summer. They're actually going to much more varied habitats in the winter. Uh, this gentleman uh, used to collect owls and other specimens for the American Museum of Natural History. He kindly went out with us for a day. And you can, you can tell he's an old style uh, collector. He actually wore a jacket even though he knew he was going to this bush country. Uh, most of us wouldn't do that. but. He, we walked around and he says, I don't know where the owls were. They used to be easy to find on this slope, um, even though, as they say, it's shrubland, not grassland. We did find some in shrubland. We also uh, found a concentration, actually, I think that's next. Yeah, so we found a real concentration near a city called Aeropuato, a little town called Valencianita. Valencianita, curiously, had an overgrazed hillside that the Mexican Environmental Agency had fenced to keep. Uh, sheep and goats and, and uh, cattle out, and then they'd taken a big plow and torn up the bedrock, that's how a little soil was left, and planted shrubs. When they did that, they created all these little openings that owls just loved, and we, used, we found up to 45 owls on this slope. We talked to a high school class while we were there, and that, that, that was a previous picture. The teacher afterwards said, that was great but you got to do more for these kids. So we took them out and showed them, help, got them to help us flush owls and survey them. They got so good at it that they would do surveys on the months that we weren't there. They were able to GPS the location of the roosts and collect burrow uh, pellets for us so we could do diet analysis. And so it was pretty cool to get the local kids that involved that they, got, they were able to actually do the science with us. Um, one of them went on to do biology in the University of Guadalajara, so we're really pleased with that. 
Another apparently is working illegally in Chicago. We know nothing about that. <laughs> we also uh, worked with a Mexican graduate student, Enrique Valdez, that hopefully soon will finish his PhD at the University of Nuevo León. We put transmitters on the owls, uh, trapped them in two different areas. This is actually an air base where the Mexican uh, Air Force trains pilots. This is a runway right behind Enrique. So we were able to get permission to go in in the evenings um, trap the owls and then follow them during the night, find out more about their ecology and then find out where they roosted in the daytime. And what we found is they would uh, roost in burrows in the ground if they had that choice and then at night they went out into the fields in the surrounding area. So unlike here where we harvest our crops in the fall and try to get everything in before it snows, in Mexico and central Mexico there's no winter rains. So they can leave the crop standing, this is sorghum, and when they need it, they go and cut it. While it's standing, it's food for insects and mice. When they cut it, they cut it six or eight inches tall. That creates a perfect landscape for the owls to go hunting, all these mice and insects that suddenly don't have any cover. And they typically cut small, small patches at a time. So it's not massive fields like we have here, it's much more a checkerboard of small fields each farmer has their own field and harvests as much crop as they need for their cattle at the time. So it's a perfect situation for the owls to be able to roost up on that hillside and then fly down onto the valley bottom and, um, and feed during the, the night time. As in contrast, in Texas where we studied them, there are cotton fields. The cotton fields lay waste all, all winter and the owls have just a meter or two water <coughs> along the Caliche Road, the dirt roads where there's a bit of grass and the owls literally walk down these grassy areas looking for food, uh, small mammals or mice. Uh, actually a much worse situation in our view for the owls than, than uh, in Mexico. They eat a lot of insects, they also eat some small mammals, they even eat scorpions, managed to take off the stinger and eat them. Uh, there were a number of outbreaks of grasshoppers while we were there and the owls immediately switch and eat only grasshoppers when uh, when they were around, but also some of them died. So our interest in supporting Enrique in this study was to find out what was their longevity in the winter. And what we found is that about 31% of the owls die through the four to five month winter. So that might sound like a lot, but it's a big chunk of the year and probably not an, a, a reason that we can actually blame the decline of the owls on. So if um, Roughly a quarter of the owls are dying in the winter. That shouldn't explain why we're losing 20% um, uh, per year and 95% over a decade. We also did a lot of education. I've already talked about our work with the high school students. These young fellows we called our ratineers. We found them, they go to school for half a day and then go out with their slingshots and shoot anything that's moving. So we called them over and had a chat with them and convinced them that they should shoot at things other than birds. Um, like targets on you know, rocks on, on rocks or something like that. And then we asked them uh, where was a good place to get mice because the local pet store had run out of mice, we bought them out and we needed more for our trapping, just dead mice to bait our traps. And they almost universally said our kitchens. So we went into town and bought mouse traps, gave each kid two traps each and said we'd pay them the equivalent of 25 cents per mouse the next morning. They all came back with four mice on these two traps. Two they caught in the evening before they went to sleep and two in the morning. So unfortunately we couldn't put that on our, our travel plan so we had to pay that out of our pocket. But every day each kid got the equivalent of a dollar until we finally left town. Um, and then we left them the mouse traps. We thought that was a good public health uh, gesture to leave them the mouse traps. We also um, survived an earthquake. We were sitting having supper in Kalima and the ground started swaying and I ran outside and uh, the uh, couple we were with, Ruth ran outside and Helen and the husband sat chatting under the cement roof. <laughs> and I said, you get out of there. She said, no, you get a way better ride on the plastic chairs. <laughs> Fortunately, the roof didn't fall down. Either. So uh, in contrast, I guess I've already mentioned in contrast to what we found in uh, Mexico and Texas, the owls have a much bleaker existence, living in crushed culverts on bare soil, um, not a lot of natural habitat left in South Texas. 
a lot of it is now corn. So what happens in the spring? So the question is how to find them. So you remember our stable isotope story. When we have a feather in the winter, we can track where it came from the previous summer. Well, in fact, at this time of year, the owls are still carrying the feathers that grew last summer. So if you trap an owl in the spring in Canada, we can figure out where it grew that feather a year earlier using stable isotopes. So the owl has gone south for the winter, come back north, and we can use the isotopes to look at the movement from one year to the next. And what we found is that the mean dispersal distance from one year to the next is 400 kilometers. About a third of the owls uh, come back to within 250 kilometers of where they spent the previous year, whether they were young or breeding adults. But the other two-thirds come back from varying distances. Uh, two of them actually appear to have their feather signatures from Mexico. So a huge dispersal distance is, I say, an average of 400 kilometers. Um, and so what we think is happening with these owls is they fly south for the winter, and then they come north. Uh, a third of them, or well, it's actually a half, come back into Canada, and about a half stay in the U.S. But also a bunch of American uh, born and raised owls come into Canada. So on average, we lose about 20% per year which is roughly the decline that we found in the 1990s when uh, we had enough to actually study. So a core reason for the decline of the owls is they're simply finding vacant habitat in uh, the United States and not returning back to Canada. Some American owls are, as I said, but not enough to make up for the difference. And the first satellite plan transmitter demonstrated that. You remember the female that flew to Baja and uh, wintered in that pretty awful looking but still successful uh, desert area. In April of that year she flew almost to the California border and then in five days flew across the Rockies. I don't know if she did a straight line or not uh, and, and covered 350 kilometers a night to end up near Denver. Then she went another 100 kilometers north near Fort Collins and stayed and nested in a prairie dog colony with a whole pile of other burring owls. So even though she nested successfully in Alberta the previous year, she short stopped over a thousand kilometers south, demonstrating what the stable isotopes are indicating, that a lot of owls don't bother coming back. If they find somewhere suitable further south, they'll simply stop there. And we've got other examples, not as dramatic as that one, where owls that we put on, these were actually put on in Grasslands Park, returned to Montana, uh, the Govanlock and the Reno PFRA. So the, these two in the PFRA pastures obviously didn't disperse as far um, as, the, um, uh, as the bird that ended up in Colorado, but still a lot of dispersal. We did have a couple come back to the park too. So even though we don't have huge samples of satellite transmitters, the general picture they paint is similar to the more detailed analysis from the stable isotope feathers. And that kind of fits with the distribution of burying owls according to the breeding bird survey. This is a survey done by volunteers on roads all over North America. And they show the most, the most concentrated area of burying owls is Colorado, Kansas, Oklahoma, um, New Mexico, uh, and then a bit into Texas. <clears throat> There's a concentration over here in California in the Salton Sea, but we've no indication our owls go over there. So we think a lot of the owls, when they're flying north up through the Great Plains, stay in these areas where they're most abundant, and we're at the edge, the population shrinking, and we're getting fewer and fewer of them coming back to Canada. And then in 2003, we had a dramatic uh, owl capture that demonstrated the dispersal even within a year. So a female owl was caught near Tucson, Arizona on April 30th, she was with a male, with a bur in a burrow, with a brood patch, and with a small, ma a small young, one young. We caught her uh, in early July in the, I think it was the Govanlock PFRA, or the National PFRA pasture, uh, with a different male with seven young in the same year. So she had two broods, one in Arizona and one up in southern Saskatchewan. Her stable isotope uh, feather signature indicated that she was from northern Montana, and her feathers indicated she was just one year old. So here's a dispersal 
even within one year of a bird that bred in the south and then came back north. So again, quite a, uh, an amazing dispersal record for a species that we think disperses a lot from year to year. So in summary, the proximal cause of the decline in Canada is short stopping in the U.S. Why, are they short? Why aren't there enough in the U.S.? Because it's caused by low productivity. Remember they lay nine eggs, only produce three young. They're just not producing enough young to replace themselves overall. The population shrinking and they're shrinking, receding back into, uh, into the U.S. for a bird that doesn't have a lot of uh, fidelity to its breeding and natal sites. So it's clear that the solution to what's happening to burring owls in Canada is not strictly a Canadian problem. It's going to involve the United States and Mexico. These are our high school students who came back one fall and they've um, taken up a collection of mock paint for one of the big walls in Valencianita and made up this uh, logo of conservation together. Um, so they got the message. We then went to the Commission for Environmental Cooperation and uh, Jason Duxbury, the fellow the student that did the isotope study, and I uh, prepared a, a trilateral conservation action plan for the CEC, which is available on the web at the CEC website. Uh, what it lacks is anyone to implement it. So we put on our, our best ideas. Um, but in, so in conclusion, the single, uh, the single mortality factor uh, is the, the single biggest mortality factor in the growing all life cycle is the 50% loss of nestlings in the first three weeks. So if you lose 50% before they even get out of the nest, the other 50%, all of the mortality factors still are, are um, uh, I won't say negligible, but they're certainly hard to fix. Um, so what Troy demonstrated and what we demonstrated for uh, two years in the park with the help of Wes and Joanne and some other um, uh, volunteers and staff in the park is that supplemental feeding can save a lot of those young. Simply putting dead mice down the burrow twice a week uh, during that three week period. Most of those three week periods occur in June. Some start a bit earlier, some are a bit later, but if you, if you're, if you don't know the exact timing of every burrow, then June, four weeks of June captures the three weeks for most nests. Um, so the nests are fed twice a week with dead mice and what's really required is a large-scale program involving not just Grasslands Park and not even just Canada at this point because we have so few left, but in fact a, a supplemental feeding program in the western U.S. so that the number of owls can increase and then hopefully they'll start to return in more numbers to Canada. So I need to thank all the landowners and land managers of uh, native grassland and the livestock. If you have a chance, eat and buy range-fed beef because um, they're supporting uh, the grasslands for burying owls. And I have to thank the, the burying owl recovery team and all the people that have cooperated. This is a summary of over 20 years of research by a lot of people. But those of you that are students there, here, uh, be careful you don't study something for too long. <laughs> you might turn into it. I'm not sure what prairie dog researchers turn into. <laughs> and thank you for your interest. I have no idea that studying burrowing owls involve volcanoes, earthquakes, or trying to escape the Mexican army. <laughs> that was really amazing, Jeff. Um, just as a, a token of our appreciation on behalf of Prairie Conservation Action Plan and Prairie Wind Silver Sage, just mm -hmm. a small thank you. Um, I want to thank everyone for coming. Um, if you have a friend that missed this presentation, um, uh, PCAP has a YouTube channel, youtube.com slash skpcap, um, and you can Google as well, so I'll try and upload the presentation on there as well, so you can um, check it out or refer a friend to it as well. Um, do we have time for questions? I do. Okay. Yep. Sure. I'm still good. young. Yep. What's the average lifespan of uh, burning out when it's not pretty good? Um, probably a year or two. Okay. So we've had, I think we've had a five or six year old owl, I don't remember in captivity how old. Banded. Seven, the old, seven is the oldest banded yeah. known owl, but that's like a 115-year-old human, right? That's not the average. Mm -hmm. So most owls are li lucky to live one or two years, yeah. mm -hmm. and that's probably reflected in the fact that they have nine eggs. Birds that have a lot of eggs usually have a short lifespan. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do you do you see the supplemental feeding program of selling out happening indefinitely? Do 
help the population recover, or or is it something that we could happen for a few years and then brewing owls would be self-sufficient? It, that's a good question. It's probably like the survival of kiwis in <coughs> South Africa and um, New Zealand. So in, in New Zealand, they take in kiwi eggs, raise them until they're eight months old, release them into the wild because there are uh, weasel family stoats and the like eating the eggs. Um, they're going to have to do that for a thousand years if they want kiwis for in a thousand years for burying owls until we change the insect and small mammal ecology on the prairies then we need to do that. So somebody's got to ask me why, what's wrong with the insects and small mammals, not talking. Well, I was going to ask something really No, important. ask me a different question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you mentioned that you thought that they were insectivores. Do you think there's any difference in how they digest? Do they, is there any proof that they get more nutrition from eating insects than small mammals? We don't, we don't know. No, I mean, in theory, if you're eating meat, you're getting lots of protein, so the small mammal would have more. Mm -hmm. But there's lots of fats and things in insects uh, that would also benefit them. So we, you know, we don't. I, I'm not aware that we know anyway. Any other questions? So what's happening with the insects and the small mammals? Okay, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> so for uh, for the insects, we've we've trashed the insect cycles that used to occur on the prairies. The most dramatic one is the North American locust, or the Rocky Mountain locust. So in North America, there used to be a locust that was three inches long, just like, and it occurred in swarms, just like we now read about in Africa and Asia. We had our own locust. The last outbreak of that locust was 1903-04. It started near Calgary, ate everything green to Winnipeg, and then effectively disappeared. So those locusts like to lay their eggs in bare soil, buffalo wallows. What did we do? We cultivated the prairies, and so there's bare soil everywhere. And then what do we do in the spring? We recultivate it and bury those eggs. So we totally disrupted the, the grasshopper cycle. And we've done that for all of the other grasshopper species, the smaller ones that we see today. We've also disrupted that cycle. The other thing that's happened, and Wes Olson's the one I have to credit for researching this, is we've also introduced a lot of pesticides onto the grasslands. So you've all heard about neonicotinoids in cultivated lands, and that when I heard about that, it's like, oh man, I'm sure glad burying owls live on grasslands. What Wes has researched is the ivermectin, dorvermectin, the, what's the generic term? Ivermectins. Ivermectins. We feed livestock to get rid of internal and external parasites. When those cows poop, that insecticide is active in their poop, and insects don't eat it. So the dung beetles, the flies, all the insects that would have eaten those cow pies uh, don't eat them, or horse pies. Um, so we've effectively eliminated those from the landscape. So again, another huge food supply. And then Wes has also pointed out in his research, in the spring, we don't put livestock on the open range. So where there would have been cattle, or sorry, where there would have been bison, sorry Wes, where there would have been bison on the open range, as the snow melted for insects to occupy those, those bison pies, there's nothing. So again, another major disruption to, uh, to insect cycles. And we've also chopped up the landscape, so if there were insect outbreaks, there's much smaller patches of land for those to occur on, and they're more likely uh, not to spread or, or um, to die out. So Dan Johnson, who studies grasshoppers out of Lethbridge, says we still have outbreaks of grasshoppers, but they're less frequent, they're less intense, and they cover smaller areas. Those are all uh, grasshopper foods. When the settlers first set up the Red Deer, uh, the Red River uh, colony near Winnipeg, in the first five years they had four crop failures due to grasshoppers and rodents. So like we saw in 97, uh, the rodents ate their crops and the grasshoppers ate their crops. And then they had one good year. That would have been four good years for burring owls and then one bad year for burring owls. Right? So we haven't had a good year for burring owls since 97. Who knows when they had, how frequently they had them before that, but they're just not getting those good years. Wes? One of your earlier graphs showed a population peak in the Regina Plain and then a peak later on in, in grasslands. 
Could that have been a population shift rather than yeah. just different habitat? Yeah, it probably was. So there were good conditions in the Regina Plain and the owls ended up there and then better here. So because of the satellite telemetry, we know they can fly 350 kilometers a night. Mm -hmm. So how far is it to Regina? It's just a night's flight, right? So they can fly around the countryside looking for somewhere with lots of food. What we think happens with some of the other owls, I won't go into too far, but the males set up a territory and get a burrow. Their job is to find food. Female's job is to go scouting, find a male in a burrow with food. If he doesn't have food, she's out of here and she goes somewhere else. <laughs> so, so it's a, a bit of a game for them to find each other. But in fact, if the owl's hooting and a female's flying two or three hundred feet overhead, she can fly 300 kilometers looking for a hooting male, check him out the next day. If he's not up to snuff, then she's gone and, and moves on. So they're, to us, they're a very mobile species. That, and evolutionary-wise, they would have followed bison herds and fire, and yeah. that landscape was changing all the time. Right? The Aspen Parkland was being reduced by fire, so they, were, they evolved to uh, take advantage of those big food supplies with the nine eggs. And, you know, sure, we don't expect them to produce eight young every year, but you don't lay that many eggs if you're not expecting to produce a lot of young fairly frequently. To take a big food supply, so. so you can imagine one of Wes's herds of a million bison moving through and then dung beetles attacking that bison poop. That would be a, a nirvana for the burring owls for that season. Has anybody looked at the energy requirements of producing nine eggs mm -hmm. in correlation with nine No, the, the only thing I do know is Troy supplemental fed the owls while they were egg laying, so as soon as they arrived, he started supplementing, and it made no difference in the number of eggs they laid. Mm -hmm. So they, they still have enough food to get nine eggs, mm -hmm. but it's when the young come forward. So when the young hatch, they're in a burrow in the ground, the ground's still cold, female has to stay, stay and keep them warm for the first three weeks. After three weeks, she can go out and help forage. In those first three weeks, it's up to the male to find enough food for eight young, I don't know if I said, typically eight hatch out of the nine eggs. She's, he's got to find enough food for eight young and the female and himself. So there's got to be a super abundant food supply or they're not going to make it. So take your choice of you know, different kinds of rodents, mice and voles, or dung beetles or grasshoppers or uh, you know, other insects, crickets, whatever. There has to be some outbreak or those, you know, those um, owls aren't going to make it. And we do know if they have good food years, the population will go up. Well, there, there is, they've supplemented them now in the United States in one area and found that in subsequent years. So I don't think it'd have to be feeding forever. But I think other things would probably have to be looked at, like the powering of the burrows, for example. You know, I, I suspect that powering the burrows to, for the prairie dogs is probably killing insects that are... One of the first things we saw... Burning that are owls beneficial for burning owls. Yeah, beneficial sentence. for burning owls, yeah. One of the first things we saw with cameras, uh, when we had cameras up on burrows, we just put them up waiting for owls to return in the springtime. So we, that took a lot of cameras, but we caught some owls arriving in the first, you know, first burrow in the, in the spring. First thing the female did was go down the burrow and look for food. You know, so I think those insects in the burrows, that's an obvious place to find food. You know, when, you're, when you've just flown 350 kilometers and you need a quick meal. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I think there are things like that that the park can look at as well. It's, and it's nice to hear that they are eventually going to wean themselves off of the, the dusting of the burrows. Because I think that we know that um, prairie dog towns are a preferred habitat. So that's why Grasslands is lucky to have that, that preferred habitat here yet. Yeah, they're, they're they also out, are almost they're blinking gone out everywhere here. else. Yeah. yeah, we've been pushed further and further south to find owls to study. And having said that, we found yeah. 12 pairs last year and 8 the year before, so they're almost blinking out here. We just got here, so we, haven't, we can't tell you how many there are this year. Come back in a week and we will. Any more questions, sir? <laughs> no. Um, I think he has to be said that. Um, the kind of the owls that started in the early 90s and now we are doing dusting to as a mitigation measure for right. it. No, no, and I know that's not the one thing I'm just saying. No, absolutely, it's but it's very yeah. interesting because one of the one of the questions that we ask ourselves is how do we meet uh, the requirements for all the species that right. survive on this uh, threatened ecosystem? It's, 
where it's hard to make the call to yeah. find the right decision for all the species. And, um, and I think part of what we are doing is actually trying to move to a longer term type of response to plague, such as the vaccination, for example. And so uh, we see that thing more as a short term solution to mitigate yeah. that potential threat. And certainly say, introducing the bison is going to help. I mean, we're now seeing the bison paddies being incorporated more into the nests of the burning owls. That's been a really positive thing, um, that the bison are, are you know, increasing in population. I think that will help. And the, and the reason the decline in the 90s, we've had workshops, right? we had get-togethers where we banged right. our heads. There wasn't a loss of habitat. There's still lots of good habitat available. Um, you know, what happened during that 10-year period, yeah. we don't know. And, and and if I only had a question, in fact, it was right there, which is, yeah. I think we agree that it's not that owls decline because nobody was doing supplemental feeding. Yeah. We see supplemental feeding as a way to eventually stop the decline, maybe help start the recover, but probably there is something, as Jeff was saying in this nice presentation, that it's like a multi-scale, multi-state uh, strategy that probably involves maybe uh, recovering land and recovering cycles for insect and small mammals on a large scale. I I don't know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I guess my question was whether that uh, three state uh, conservation proposal included anything related to insect and how much data we have to support. Uh, yeah. This we didn't, and we didn't, mm -hmm. whether maybe that's the next step for research. Like. Uh, yeah. And I don't think we know how to recover insect and small animal populations, or if it's even possible with the land uses that we've already got on the landscape. You know, we're not, we're not going to be telling people they can't do whatever on, on their land. It's just not going to happen. Well, so. and brewing owls have had such big blocks. When you think about 98% of the prairie dog towns yeah. being wiped out, that was a huge reservoir of habitat there. Uh, you know, that, that alone, when I think when I think of that, you know, then you got this owl that's got to find a hole in the ground, or, or at least some place to hide every day uh, in, in very populated well, areas. When it's migrating, right? When they, it's migrating, you know. yeah. You know, it's, it's a, it's, I've actually wondered why they're still here. I, I sometimes I ask, why are there still burning outs here? Like, you know, when you think of what they've got, it, got it, you know, such a long migration uh, and, and trying to find a safe place to hide every night, I, ugh, scary place One, one place they are doing well is the Salton <laughs> Sea, which is where you're fruit and vegetables come from in the winter or the majority of them uh, in Southern California and it's an irrigated landscape so they seem to do well where water is put onto the desert and that produces more insects and, and small mammals um, and where the, I've been there, where the, the irrigation system outflows like you get here the surplus water goes in and people aren't worried about holes in the outflow of an irrigation system they're worried about holes where it's coming in. And so the owls live in those outflows and they go into the fields and forage, not unlike what we see in southern, uh, in Mex in central Mexico, where they're eating crops. And I've actually studied, a, I had a graduate student in Spain, and we studied little owls in a market garden area near Barcelona. And there you've got intense uh, cultivation and, and a two foot wide strip of crop, you know, parsley, onions, whatever cut every week for the, for the local farmers market and every night the owls would come in and forage in that newly opened piece of landscape. Uh, there they actually eat even more earthworms but they're eating a lot of insects. So it's the same kind of dynamic. So I think they can live in human, la human form landscapes but only in certain specialized things. To what? Sorry. Um, I was wondering, I know some says they're small, but do we have you looked at like the difference in success of the owls maybe between ones that are nesting inside the bison paddock and the ones that are outside, like in the park? Like no, we, we haven't looked at, well I mean the, the bison are um, over a lot of the park now, right, except for the, the Dixon Walker extension. And the first two years we actually found more owls doing better on the Dixon Ranch. And so Brad was really excited, he's like finally there's proof that the park should be grazed. And then that fell apart, and we were at the Dixon Y colony today, and there were none there. You know, some years we've had 10. Owls do like to be grouped together. There's probably a mutual benefit in warning predators. 
So we don't find they're evenly spread through the colonies. They occur in clusters. And so like there's one smaller colony in the last few years that's had a, almost half of the owls in the park in one small colony. So they, they, do, they certainly like to be together. But we haven't found any real association with or without bison, with or without cattle. So I'm sorry. Well, the question I have is, the rest of the small migrating birds that migrate way south, are their populations fluctuating like that or declining as, as rapidly? Or? all grassland birds are declining. Crash. Is that right? Yeah. Now, we've had the, the, the opportunity to study these more intensely, and they're big enough they can carry devices like you've been showing, mm -hmm. but in many cases we don't know why they're declining. But one could imagine a lot of them are insectivores, when they have young in the nest, most even the seed eaters have to get protein, and so they have to feed their young insects. And so the same problem with insects that we think is happening, causing boring owl decline, is probably um, contributing to other birds' declines too. And during wintering habitats, in general, the wintering area is much smaller, like the Sprague's Pippin, it's a pretty small area right. in northern Mexico and southern states. So. Um, there, if there is effect on winter habitat, it's well bigger. I mean, bird owls in Mexico, it was pretty interesting. They, they're hanging out like on a beach, <laughs> in a quarry. We, we find at one point we decided we should declare all quarries as rock, uh, you know, rock quarries and gravel pits and uh, habitat for wintering <laughs> owls. Cause they were like that. They love that kind of open. You know, they find find a rock. Even when they had a burrow, they often would choose not to not to be in the burrow. It's quite interesting, but they don't eat a lot of food, and they don't have to move very far, and they become very nocturnal in the winter. You do not see them. Mm -hmm. They really hide, and and I, I think life is, is pretty easy for them. I think getting hit by vehicles is, is a kind of big concern. There's some areas in the states where they find a lot of dead owls during migration on highways. And I think that's another concern. If you want to see a funny video about owls and the response to vehicles, ask Stefan to send a link <laughs> that he just sent us. <laughs> It's a cartoon about an owl getting back at vehicles for killing his female and he eventually has this complex mechanical device that puts a fork in the middle of the road and blows the vehicle up <laughs> killing his female. It's pretty funny. Yeah. Is any factors, hardest factor other than the disappearing of insects and mites like climate change? Because from the from the distribution map it seems that the northern border is like shifting southward and the one south is staying almost fairly. It's not like that they are disappearing evenly from the entire distribution, rather than they're clustering toward the, the southern border. The south, yeah. Which would indicate that the south is still good habitat, that it hasn't become too hot yeah. or dry or whatever. Um, there, there are a couple of climate related things that are probably happening. Um, a lot of the mortality, like the total nest failures that we see in the park, are due to flooding. So where you get intense rain events. Uh, once, one year we went out to the Dixons and there'd been a microburst of intense rain. And we actually found a female owl plastered into the dirt, just as though a giant had stepped on her and squashed her in. Another year, um, only a couple of years ago, I guess it was the second year that you guys were helping with the uh, supplemental feeding, the police coolie colony flooded. And you could see the water line on the tops of burrows, and the owls tend to choose lower burrows. They don't choose the, the big high ones that the prairie dogs have. But I think actually a lot of prairie dogs got flooded out too. Mm -hmm. So that, that whole watershed flooded. Even today, when we went to Dixon Walker ranches, there's water lying on the ground. They clearly got, well, you guys are there. <laughs> there's clearly more water there than there is even here. So it's not a huge difference. So then the question is, are these intense rainstorms more frequent? And maybe they're localized, but are they more frequent than they were 30, 40, 50 years ago? And frequent enough that they're causing enough mortality to contribute? So in, in all likelihood, there are added mortality factors. It could be flooding, it could be other things uh, that are contributing. But when we look at the whole life cycle and what can we as biologists affect, the one thing we can do is save those young in the nest. That's the one thing we do know how to do. Uh, there's more vehicles on the landscape. There are examples, especially in Idaho, of stretches of interstate highway where there's you know, multiple dead owls every kilometer just schmucked along the highway. We're not going to stop vehicles. There's no obvious way to get a, a burring owl not to fly across the road when a vehicle's coming, or any other bird for that matter. And vehicles aren't going to slow down to 30 or 40 kilometers an hour. So.
you know, the, how, what, what is it that we can realistically propose that would help. So we don't really know how climate change is going to affect them. Depends how variable the weather is and how that interacts with the owls. Well, that's all the questions. Thank you. Um, I just want to let everyone know there's um, free lemonade there. Um, this is Allie's first day. Uh, pre and Silver Sage opens up tomorrow, but if there's something that catches your eye, I think she'd like to try out the till. <laughs> 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 so thank you all for coming.